Okay, so my title for today's talk, the last talk over the last day and the last session before the keynote, um, was originally metrics literacy, educating researchers and research support staff on scholarly metrics. But since I acknowledge that it's Friday afternoon, um, and if you feel similar like I do, I uh, renamed the talk to metrics literacy on a caffeine high. So I tried to add as many uh, gifs uh, and emojis as I could so that you bear with me. But I do need your attention and I do need you to participate. So just to give you a little bit of a background, so this is uh, probably the first talk I'm ever giving that doesn't have data and results. Um, so this is just an idea right now for my, my research program in the coming years. Um, so what I always notice, so my background is bibliometrics. I started my PhD already 10 years ago. <laughs> um, I did finish it. I'm a prof now. I didn't say. <laughs> but I, I started to, to know more about bibliometrics 10 years ago. And what I always saw from the beginning, and I think the problem still persists today, that on the one hand, we have the bibliometric community that comes up with indicators, uh, new indicators all the time, but we actually have quite a number of established indicators that we know work with, with certain limitations, but they know uh, better than others do. Um, so we have field normalized citation rates so we can compare citation impact across fields. We have something that are called percentile ranks. So for example, um, the top 1% most productive authors or the top 1% highly cited papers, which work much better since uh, we know that distributions are skewed, they work much better than uh, a simple average. We can also look at uh, collaboration, for example. There are so many indicators that the bibliometrics community knows that work. Um, and also uh, what we usually do are benchmarks. We are also uh, using social network analysis to look at the citation context. Um, so this is usually what happens in that community of indicator makers. Um, and then we have academia, on the other hand. So the people that are usually in their uh, fields and their jobs really smart, but when it comes to metrics, they don't tend to know that much. So what they do is that they go back to impact factor and h-index, which are two indicators that have for a long time been proven to not work uh, for what they're used for. And this is kind of the, the problem I think we have. We have this divide um, between the indicator makers or developers and those that use them. And uh, actually, just uh, for those of you who saw Jason's slide earlier, uh, I added this. So he was talking about experts, communicators, and regular people, I think. Um, this actually fit quite well with my talk. I think we have the metrics experts on one side, uh, the regular academics on the other side, but then there's like this big gap uh, because the communication um, the explanation and I think kind of the PR of the, the metrics community is not happening. Except for in rare cases, so we do have something like the uh, Leiden Manifesto, for example, and also uh, Vincent, who will be giving the keynote after this, um, and Cassidy pu re recently published a book, Measuring Research, that is actually written for an academic um, audience. So there are certain um, approaches now that try to explain metrics to a larger academic audience, but I think the issue is still that they are very, very long texts. Um, even a small book uh, takes some time to be read. Uh, even the Leiden Manifesto, even if it's just a few pages, it's still text that people need to read, which can be fine, but I think that we can do things better. But I think before getting started, I want you to actually uh, test your own metrics literacy. So. Please take out your, your laptops or phones and go to uh, bit.ly slash metrics literacy quiz. And no, I didn't tweet the link, but I think you can all type this. <laughs> and then just go through and uh, choose all the answers that you think uh, are the correct answers. So it's kind of a multiple choice. Um, you can click all that you think apply. And then please submit. It's not working? Yeah, the capital letters? Sorry. I thought that would make it easier. Is it working? Awesome. OK, go. OK, so I told you I'm going to make this a bit more interesting because I already posted this on Twitter as a yes, no, or true, false poll. And we'll see if Twitter did better than uh, you did on a Friday afternoon. 
So f I hope you remember kind of what you did uh, answer. So just to test yourself, let's see how you did. For, so I'm going to give you the answers now, the right ones. So for every like good answer you got, like whatever was right, you add one point for yourself. And if you did something wrong, like didn't select the right answer or select the wrong answer, you subtract, subtract, subtract one, OK? So bibliometrics. Um, they have not yet replaced peer review, thank God, but they have definitely influenced it. They, I think they have definitely harmed or affected scholarly publishing in a ne negative way because they have caused things like salami publishing, citation cartels, or the whole publish or perish uh, idea. Um, well, m some people might think they are a blessing because they help you to identify the most productive and successful researchers in any given field. Well, not really. Um, they definitely are quantitative indicators based on scholarly publications and citations. And they actually can help uh, when reviewing the literature, because that's what they were actually invented, invented for. So um, Eugene Garfield was actually building a big uh, search engine based on citations. The impact factor was created by Eugene Garfield for selecting journals to include in the Science Citation Index in the 1960s. Um, his idea was just to you know, have, have an average to, to compare which ones to select and which ones not. Um, it is size dependent. Um, no, that's not true because the whole idea was actually you divide the number of citations by publications to get something uh, to compare uh, journals of different sizes. Um, it definitely, although it's been done a lot, should and uh, yeah, cannot be used to estimate a researcher's impact by adding up the impact factors of the journals they published in. This is something we're trying to get rid of, uh, but it's still being done, especially in the biomedical fields. Um, is mentioned by one-fifth of Canadian and U.S. universities in review, tenure, and promotion documents. Yes, this is the RPT project by uh, Juan and, and Erin. <laughs> so uh, it's, it's still research in progress, but um, you know that it's still mentioned a lot there. Um, it definitely has affected scholarly communication by becoming a synonym for journal prestige, and it's definitely not a field normalized two-year citation rate to compare journals from different disciplines. Um, the age index was, yes, invented by a physicist. That also shows us something about the visibility of the bibliometrics community that actually are supposed to make the indicators. They're just uh, overrun by, by smart physicists. Um, is a useful indicator to compare the overall impact of research? Definitely not, because of the issues it, it has. You, can de you could apply to any kind of set of papers. It doesn't have to be authors only, but please don't. Uh, it is size dependent, because you, you can only have a, a high uh, H index if you have a lot of publications, which also brings me to F. Yes, it's affected by a researcher's age, because uh, you can only have uh, 50 publications if you, um, you know, you don't do that as a PhD student, or hope not. Um, and it definitely, in a paper uh, in 2011, I think already has been shown to be an inconsistent and therefore not an appropriate indicator of scientific impact. So if you add up all your points, uh, you can see where you are on that scale. So either uh, if you reach 10 points, I think that should be the maximum, maximum, then you're welcome here as a metrics nerd. And please help me to teach others. If you have minus seven, which is, I think, the, the, the lowest you could get, well, then you better hope that I get some funding for this uh, so I can help you out. Um, if you have zero, that basically means you answered randomly and a monkey could do that. So uh, maybe you also need a bit more help in that sector. So. Um, we already know that scholars are overwhelmed by too much to read. We hear this all the time. And I think this is really going that area of where I showed you um, mostly the, the things, the communication that we have from the bibliometrics community towards the more general academics uh, or ca general academia. It's mostly text uh, because, yes, you can go right into detail, but it's definitely not the most uh, efficient and effective way to communicate something. So I think we can learn a lot from just like looking at uh, um, educational content, for example, of YouTube. I really like uh, Minute Physics or, or Minute Earth, but there's so much more content where you actually um, could use audiovisual material to be more efficient and effective to com uh, communicate and explain very complex material, because that's how our brain works. We can uh, pre-attentively already perceive uh, color, size, and so on, so why not make use of that? So this is the results from the Twitter study. 
Uh, they actually didn't do so badly, but it, I mean, this is also people that have to hear what I'm tweeting, so they probably already uh, are a bit more met metrics aware, I guess. Um, the only question where the majority was wrong is the one on the uh, impact factor being a field normalized citation rate where you could compare different fields. Definitely no, a biomedical journal will always have a higher impact factor than a math journal. Uh, so they they were wrong, um, but I think even in the um, in the difference between whenever it doesn't go up to 100%, there's room to improve. And again, I think this sample is really biased because these people are obviously already in, uh, interested in what I have to say, which means interested in metrics. So just some of these examples, that's what I just showed. Uh, the only answer that was false um, was the size independency, so that was the whole idea of the impact factor. Um, but I think explaining this, uh, there is so much room to do this. So my idea for the research project, uh, the metrics literacy project, is actually to have a kind of a building block system. Um, I, I'm thinking about uh, little informational videos, for example, or infographics. We're even experimenting with 3D printing in this area just to um, yeah, make it a nice experience to want to learn, right? We, we know this all from, from, from the educational context. Why not apply it to um, these metrics that affect academia? So I identified these five pillars, kind of. The first one is, is asking what do metrics uh, actually measure and uh, also what do they not measure. The second one is more like the technical nitty gritty bit behind each indicator. So how, how do they actually work? What exactly is the impact factor? But also what exactly and how does the field normalized citation rate work? Um, then, especially when we come from uh, citations, but then also more social media based content, when do metrics measure? So we already know that for citations, in order for them to accumulate, you probably need around uh, two years, depending on the field. Now, with preprints, things might be, um, might be uh, speeding up a bit, but you definitely still have a very different citation window than you would have a Twitter. Twitter window where most things are happening in the first couple of hours or days. Uh, so I think the time aspect is really important, um, which also leads me to the whole, uh, we need better metadata for all those different uh, you know, versions of publications and, and tracking when something is published. Um, I also think, and this is just one of the things that I really love to do, as you might have seen in the, the whole idea, but I think uh, that we also need to uh, take care of visualizing metrics and uh, uh, take care of how metrics are um, interpreted. And then we have this like fifth column of how do metrics influence scholarly communication. There we have all these adverse effects uh, like the salami publishing or uh, self-citations or citation cartels. I uh, kind of uh, have this planned out uh, for the, three, the next three to five years, uh, fingers crossed that if I find somebody who thinks this is important enough to, to give me some funding. But on the first level, on the, on the bottom level, I see this to be done for bibliometrics because these are the indicators that we know well uh, where we already have some solutions but still have things to um, uh, yeah, fight against, like the misuse of indicators, especially impact factor and H index. Um, so I think this is a nice way to get started, but um, then it could also be applied to alt metrics, uh, usage metrics like downloads, or even techno metrics like patents or something like that. So that's the whole idea. Um, I think that we really need to improve uh, metrics literacy of, of researchers, but also re research administrators, including uh, any kind of support staff like librarians, uh, funders, or uh, research managers at universities. Um, I think, and this is the part of the research I'm super excited about, um, we want to actually do A-B testing that we uh, try out which method to, um, to communicate a certain content is the most efficient and effective. Um, uh, and of course, I want this all to be available open, so I'm kind of thinking in the context um, or uh, using the the, um, the idea of the carpentry, so the software carpentry or data carpentry, to basically have a platform where we have all the educational material available openly and for everyone to uh, use to educate themselves, but also use to educate others. So I do want to share this, um, and I, I think it's really important that also um, the community uh, where I'm from, where we're developing, developing metrics um, and we're doing research on it, that we have kind of a responsibility to educate people about it. So I think we, we cannot keep complaining that people are um, 
misusing the impact factor or H index or any other metric that uh, doesn't work and definitely does one metric never works. Um, but that we actually have to do something about it and, and not only create new indicators, but actually explain how they can be used in appropriate context. Um, and I think that multimedia and not only text is actually so much better, uh, so much more efficient to convey this. So I'm thinking about little YouTube videos. And if you see those little blocks, I was thinking about these little building blocks. If you just want to know about the inconsistency of the age index, you look at one infographic or one five minute video. But if you want to know everything, you could also do, do that, right? But really keep the, um, the barrier of entry kind of low and not add to the, uh, yeah, the information overload and uh, on top of the pile of, of all the documents that have to be read by researchers. So if you uh, do like this idea, then <clears throat> I need funding. <laughs> um, I will apply for funding in a regular way, but uh, this was the first time I'm pitching this idea, so I hope you like it. And I think we have about 10 minutes actually for questions. And actually, rather than questions, I also want uh, suggestions of what we could do and where we could start. Thank you. There's somebody there. You can also, yeah. Oh, oh, look, you have a need for education and metrics. <laughs> Salami publishing basically happened uh, once we started looking at the number of publications as, uh, as an indicator of productivity of a researcher. So instead of uh, you know, maybe taking six months to write one high quality good paper, they would slice it up like a salami into three or four smaller publications with a lot of redundancy, reusing the same data and only adding a little bit because four is better than one. Okay, uh, one comment I have is that on Wikidata we're building uh, a representation of publications and things around them uh, where we could also experiment together. Uh, one thing is that the bibliometrics community right now, they all build their own corpora, they do their simulations, that's not shared, mm -hmm. but through Wikidata we could actually share the um, the experiments even, the, the process of developing metrics, and then uh, show the effects in small controlled studies. So I would encourage people to think along those lines, and I would be happy to participate in the planning that you do. That is an excellent idea, and I totally uh, love what's happening now that, uh, yeah, the bibliometrics community has always been closed. We relied on uh, for-profit databases and still do, like the Web of Science uh, and, or Scopus. Um, but I, I love what's, what's happening with the open citations. Um, the problem is, though, when we start, and, and that's the one big, big issue, if we're missing a large chunk, uh, i.e. Elsevier, um, then we cannot do, or we shouldn't be doing any metrics. Even if you have in the fine print, it's missing 30 or 40 percent of all output and citations. Um, people will not look at the fine print, and then we create new biases. Um, which maybe would you know lead people to not publish in Elsevier anymore, but th then you're really like underrepresenting the whole output. But I love the idea of experimenting and showing using real data to show the effect of indicators, because then you could really show like, oh, so if two people uh, publish on the same paper, they each have an H index. That doesn't mean that with one more citation to the common paper, both of their H indexes goes up, right? So like really being very practical, and I think with animation or videos or even infographics, you. Can can do that so much better than writing another paper about it. Okay. Uh, yeah, we know the, the limitations of the, the impact. Yeah, we uh, maybe not <laughs> we, not all, not we all, but <clears throat> the, the problems at the various levels and the consequences also. But there's also an uh, no, really excuse me for the <clears throat> the voice. Uh, there's an ingrained notion of a, a good journal or a leading journal in a field. Mm -hmm. And it is known that the good journals or leading journals, it's, it's correlated with the impact factor. Yeah. So what do we do with this notion of good or leading journal? Uh, which has the, some of the same consequences because, uh, you know, we're not supposed to, uh, to judge the research by the journal in which it was published. But you have this notion that's yeah. really and well. So uh, how does it fit in the yeah. maybe other metrics or 
Is that something that could be debunked also in the notion of a good mm -hmm. journal or leading, leading journal? And it's a great question, and it's kind of like this confusing part of the mix-up that, um, yes, all papers published in a journal make up the impact factor, but not the impact factor makes up the citation impact of each uh, single paper. So that's based on a skewed distribution and using an, a mean for the skewed distribution, you don't really represent the uh, uh, a large share of the the publications because most of them will not be cited or or are like um, cited much less than that average, right? So uh, that's basically a statistical problem. But yes, of course, it's true that the on the journal level, on on average, it shows us something that on average they get more citations, right? But what doesn't make any sense is to have a um, decimal, like three decimal point number and saying an impact factor of 2.53 is better than an impact factor of 2.49. Um, so, so the problem there is, is like, of course it's linked to prestige and I think it's also like reinforcing it from both sides, so of course, uh, if you have the idea that uh, this is a high quality journal, it has a high impact factor, then you, you keep submitting your high, you know, like, uh, of course there's a correlation, but it's not on the paper level, and it, publishing in a high impact journal is, is great for you to reach a good audience, but it doesn't guarantee you a certain number of, of uh, citations. And, and exactly making that dif the, this distinction clear that yes, uh, together all the papers in a journal make up the impact factor, but not the impact, you can't apply the impact factor back to all the papers in that journal. And I'm only bashing the impact factor in H-index here because they're really the most used one, but I could come up with a couple of under, other indicators that don't make, make sense either, but that would take a bit more than 20 minutes. Sorry. Uh, there, there's been some discussion about equity and, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, science from the global south or, or mm -hmm. science in India, for example. Um, and, and to a certain extent, the good journals are citing uh, science that is coming from a particular perspective. And how, how can these uh, metrics um, sort of reveal uh, mm -hmm. the, the burden of subscription and the sources of the, uh, of the papers that are getting cited, mm -hmm. and, you know, t to... Uh, and that's a great question, and this is also a great example of that. Um, if you don't do the, you know, let's say layman automatic bibliometrics where you click on one button and then the most sophisticated measure you get is the H index, if you actually have bibliometric studies that do take time because you have to clean data, uh, you have to make sure that, you know, they're computed in the right way um, because the metadata is not perfect yet. If you uh, look at those studies, they actually do all this, and they, they look at like, okay, where do the citations come from? Because you can can look at the the address of the affiliations of the author. So that's what I meant earlier too with like social network analysis. There's a lot of things being done that looks beyond the the raw number. So like metrics literacy, I also talk about more like, um, I guess it doesn't all have to be a metric, but the underlying data as well. Um, and there are so many more uh, things you could do with this, but un un until our metadata is clean and perfect, we have to you know, put some time into those bibliometric studies, and those are the things that don't happen on the click of a button, so they don't get the same visibility. But for, for example, the European Commission, if they ask for, for a bibliometric study that takes a few months or years to compile, uh, they, they do have more information like that. Okay, I think we've got one minute left. So if there are any more questions, oh, there's one, one left. So, what, I mean, you? I, well, I don't have a question. It's a question actually more for the audience because this, this is, I mean, the piece of, of this program that, uh, that I've been sort of talking to you about and one of the places where I see the biggest challenge beyond once you create the materials to do uh, the, to inform and to make sure that we're figuring out the best way to deliver the information is what are the, um, what are the, the places and the vehicles for which we get this, make sure that we can bring it to the attention of the mm -hmm. regular academics. Mm -hmm. right? And so that is a question that I think is one of the biggest challenges that we've had to face as, uh, as a community working on developing these indicators is that, and even at all these meetings and all of the issues around scholarly communications that we want to make changes, but then 
how do we reach the regular academics that are not already engaged in yeah. these things? Um, so it's not so much a question so much, I'm, we've talked about these things all the time, so I know your answer to the question, but I wanted to bring that to the audience to say where, you know, where are the places and, and, uh, and what are the, the channels that we can use to reach regular academics so that we can try making those changes? I, th I think we're just running out of time. If yeah. you can answer that really quickly. If that's well, I don't have an answer yet, and I Great. think it's a, a main challenge, but it would be nice if, as a community, we work together, and that's why I want these metrics to be, or the educational material to be open and reusable. Okay, thank you. Thanks very much. Thank, thank you very much.